Hi, everybody. Welcome to our Nature at School webinar series. Today, we're with Karen Gurley from Southeast Michigan discussing birds are my peeps. Let's go, Karen. Hi, everyone. I'm Karen Gorley with the Michigan DNR, and today we're going to talk about birds. I'm going to share my screen with you right now so you can see some great bird pictures, and we'll, we'll also do some sounds and some other fun things, too. All right. So I am excited to be here today so we can learn about birds together. I work at Mayberry State Park in Northville. The arrow is pointing right about where I am in southeast Michigan. But no matter where you live, you can see lots of kinds of birds anywhere in the state. I think that bird watching is for everyone. With all the extra time we've been spending closer to home, people are noticing the birds around them just a little bit more. I think that birds can connect us to nature and you can see them anywhere in the world. Birds are also indicators of a healthy ecosystem and they play a role in keeping the balance of nature. Birds can provide us essential services like insect control or seed dispersal or pollination or even some cleanup in the environment. If you have a favorite kind of bird, why don't you write it into the chat feature below. Let's quickly go over just a few bird facts just so we remind ourselves what makes an animal a bird. So birds have feathers that help to keep them warm and dry and they have wings that help them fly and tails that provide balance and stability. You know it's a bird if they have a beak or a bill and their beaks are specialized for the different kinds of foods that they eat. A bird's feet have adaptations that help them to live in lots of different kinds of habitats and environments. Birds also lay eggs. There are a lot of different kinds of eggs, different colors and sizes, and most birds will put their eggs into a nest and they use different construction materials and different locations to put their nests in. So here is a picture or several pictures of different kinds of birds that are pretty common in Michigan. And you might even recognize a few of them, even if you don't know their names. Why don't you take a few minutes to count how many birds in these pictures look familiar to you? You might know just one or two or three or four, or you might even know five or even more birds that look familiar. We're going to come back to this picture in a little while. So birding is for everyone and today we're going to talk about how to get to know the birds that are around you. We're going to cover a few simple tools that you can use. We're going to think about some clues that we would look for to help us figure out the bird. And then we'll finish up by talking about different ways that we can help birds that live in our neighborhoods. So you can get started birding or bird watching with spending no money at all. Just by watching and listening, you'll get to know the birds around you, but you might have a few tools at home that will help you to be a better birder. The first one would be binoculars. And if you look at my video feed, you can see that I have a pair of binoculars. These are small binoculars that are lightweight and easy to carry around. The eye pieces are fairly close together, so that is helpful for people who have smaller faces. These binoculars are a little bit bigger and a little bit heavier, but they provide a better view. You can um, see more birds because the field of view is a little bit bigger and they let more light in, so you'll have an easier time identifying birds if you use bigger binoculars. If you don't have any binoculars, you might want to borrow some from a friend or a family member, or you can make your own beginner binoculars using two paper tubes, just like the one I have here. You can tape or glue them together and decorate them any way you like and put a string for around your neck. And even though you can't use magnification with these types of binoculars, they do help you zero in on the bird that you're looking at by eliminating the distractions that are around you. So these are a good way to get started. The next really helpful tool is to have a field guide or two, 
or a bird guide. These will help you look up different kinds of birds and compare birds that might look similar. I have several field guides here. This one is the Birds of Michigan, and it uses photographs to help you identify the birds that you might see. Another great field guide would be this one, and this one uses drawings instead and has many different kinds of birds on the same page so that you can compare similar birds. All field guides will have a little bit of a write-up about the bird that you're looking at, as well as a range map so that you can see if the bird that you're finding is actually in your area. It's really important to get a field guide that zeroes in on the area where you're looking at birds, whether it's the eastern United States or the western United States if you're on vacation. You can borrow field guides from the library. The next tool that's really easy to use is the websites that are uh, dedicated to birds. Audubon for Kids links you to activities, DIY activities, um, information about birds, adventures, games, and art lessons. All About Birds by Cornell has a lot of really detailed information about each kind of bird. It also will link you to live cams. So if you want to look at birds in other parts of the world that might be at feeders or on nests, that's a great site to go to as well. If you have access to a mobile device, then these free apps are really great to check out. The Audubon Bird Guide is like having one of those field guides to go in your pocket. eBird is a site that links you to citizen science. People upload their bird sightings from all over the world into eBird so you can see where different birds are being spotted. LarkWire is a fun game that teaches you how to recognize bird songs. And the Merlin Bird ID helps you identify birds by answering just five simple questions. And we're going to try out Merlin Bird ID. So let's say I am looking out my window and I see this bright yellow and black bird on a bird feeder. I'm going to hook up my phone so that you can see how Merlin Bird ID works. All right. So you should be able to see my phone screen now on your screen. And I'm going to start the Merlin Bird ID. So the first question it's going to ask you is where did you see the bird? And today I'm in Northville. You can type a different location if your location doesn't show up on the screen. When did you see the bird is the second question. It automatically defaults to today, but if you saw the bird last week or at a different time, you can change that selection. The next question, what size was the bird? I think that this bird was sparrow sized or smaller, so I'm going to select that smaller bird on my screen. The fourth question asks, what were the main colors? If you remember, that bird was yellow and black. I'll hold it up to the screen. Here's a picture of it again. That was the bird that we were looking at, so I am going to click yellow and black. Next, it wants to know what behavior the bird was exhibiting, and that bird was eating at a feeder, so I'm going to click that box. Next, it will generate a list of possible birds based on the way I answered the questions, and you can see that the first option that comes up is the American goldfinch, and I believe that was the bird that we were looking at. If you scroll along, you can see this bird in different plumages or feather patterns because goldfinches look different if they're young or female or male. If this was not my bird, oops, <laughs> Go back to that bird. If this was not my bird, I could scroll down and look at other possible birds that it might be. If this is not my bird or none of the birds match, then I would be able to change the answers to my questions. But by clicking this is my bird, I can create an account and save all of my different bird sightings right here on Merlin Bird ID.
All right. So that's an easy app to use that helps us to identify different kinds of birds. Let me share my screen again and we'll move on. All right, so we've talked about different kinds of tools like binoculars and field guides. We've talked about apps and websites, but really the best way to get to know birds is just by watching and listening. You can use a sit spot or a favorite place that you can visit from time to time. And it's really not as important to be able to name every bird you see. It's more about observing their behavior and paying attention to what birds can tell us as they go about their day. Just use patience and practice to get to know the nature of a space that's important to you. Some people like to keep track of the birds that they see. For example, I showed you how you could do that on Merlin Bird ID, but you also might want to keep a bird watcher's checklist. I have a book right here that I take with me every time I go on vacation and I start listing all the different birds that I've seen in different places. You can keep a list from your backyard or a list, a life list, birds that you've seen over your whole lifetime. Other people prefer to keep a nature journal. Nature journals are a great way to um, take notes and draw pictures of things that you've seen. And it's really about using um, your curiosity about nature to guide you. I have a little nature journal that I like to take with me when I go out for walks. If you are interested in learning how to draw, there are a number of really great videos online that can teach you drawing skills for drawing birds. But really it's about using your curiosity about nature to guide you. So the next thing we wanna cover is different clues. I think bird watching is a little bit like detective work. If you gather enough clues, you can solve the mystery of what the bird is that you're looking at. You want to spend as much time as you can observing the bird and maybe take a few notes or quick sketches or even photos to remind you what the bird looked like. So the first clue we want to think about is the habitat that you're in and the time of year. Even though there are birds everywhere, you won't see the same birds in every place. Think about what kind of birds you might see if you're in a city or a forest, or out in a field, or even in your backyard. Think about your surroundings as if you were a bird to think about where you might spot them. Also think about the season or the time of year. Some birds live here all year round. Others are only here in the summer or the winter. And there are even birds that just pass through in the spring and in the fall during their migration time. Our next clue is the size of the bird. Compare the bird to birds that you might already be familiar with. Most of us are familiar with this bird, the robin. And if you look here, I have a cutout of a robin that's life size. You can see that it's slightly larger than my hand. Maybe the bird that you're looking at is smaller than a robin, like this sparrow. You can see that the sparrow is a much smaller bird than the robin or it might be larger, like a crow. And I do have a crow cut out. Let me step back a little so you can see how big that crow might be. Inside those bird field guides, you'll find a birder's yardstick that compares the size of birds in inches, but I think it's a little bit easier to compare the size of a bird you're looking at with ones that you're already familiar with. Next, think about the shape of the bird. Certain birds have things in common. So if you look at the picture of the geese and the ducks, you can see that they both have webbed feet, but a goose has a much longer neck and a taller body and ducks are shorter. If you look at the woodpecker, you'll often see woodpeckers on the side of a tree and they have a long chisel type beak so they can drill into the wood to find insects. So look at silhouettes of birds and think about what other birds it might remind you of. Next, let's look at the colors and the patterns. Some birds have bright, splashy colors like these ones. Others are a little bit more camouflaged or subtle with their colors. 
Um, but the lighting might not be that great or the bird might be too far away to really get a good look at its colors. So also look at different patterns that you see with the feathers. And this shows us different places where we might want to look for those patterns, maybe on the chest or the tail or the wing or the beak or around the eye. The next clue is behavior. What is the bird doing? Is there anything interesting about the way it moves? Is it flying high in the sky by itself or maybe with a group of other birds just like it? Does it come to your bird feeder? Is it perched on a branch or a wire or is it on the ground? These will all help us identify the bird too. The last thing to look at is the birds or listen for is the bird's songs or calls. If you get to know the birds in your area by listening to them every day, you'll start to become familiar with their songs and recognize who's doing the singing in the same way that you recognize your favorite song when it starts to play. Or maybe you recognize your best friend's voice when you hear them calling you. You can also use memory aids or mnemonics, which is a way of putting words to a bird's call to remind you of what that call sounds like. And we'll practice that with these three birds. That first bird is an American crow, and I think the crow sounds like he's saying, caw, caw, caw. Ah, 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 ah. That bird in the middle, is a goldfinch and I think when the goldfinch is flying he sounds like he's saying potato chip potato chip let's listen to him and this third bird way over on the right is a great horned owl they're pretty hard to see because when they're perched in a tree during the day, their feathers camouflage them so that they blend in. Most of the time they're active at night when it's dark out, but you can sometimes hear them calling at night. And to me, they sound like they're saying, who's awake? Me too. Let's listen. <laughs> All right, so now we're going to practice and we're going to put all of our clues together. So remember the clues we talked about, the habitat and time of year, the size and the shape of the bird, the colors and patterns we see, the behaviors we might observe, and the songs or the calls that we're going to hear. And we'll practice using three different common songbirds. So here's the first one. Most of us already know what this bird is, but let's look at those clues to see how we can come to that conclusion. I see this bird most often in the summertime in my backyard, on the lawn, or in trees or bushes nearby. It's a songbird shape, and this bird is larger than a sparrow, but smaller than a crow. When I look at the colors and patterns, the first thing I notice is that this bird has kind of an orangey red chest and its back is kind of a grayish brown. But if I look under his chin, I see a little white patch and around his eye, he has a white eye ring. When I see this bird in my yard, he's often on the lawn, hopping and stopping, hopping and stopping. And sometimes he turns his head like he's listening for his favorite food, which is worms. When I hear this bird singing, especially in the morning or evening, I think he sounds like he's saying, cheer up, cheerily, cheerio, let's listen. Maybe you've heard that sound in your backyard. If we put all of our clues together, we find that this bird is called the American Robin. And Robins are the state bird of Michigan. They're also sometimes considered a sign of spring because most Robins do go further south in the fall. If they stayed around in the winter and tried to find worms, it would be pretty tough because of the snow on the ground. But there are some Robins that will stick around and they'll gather in flocks 
and live in the forest and they switch their diet to eating fruits and berries that they find. So as long as they find enough food, they'll stick around all year long. When spring comes, those forest flocks disperse to their breeding territories and the ones that went south come back up north and when spring gets close, we start seeing robins again. Let's try this bird. Maybe you've seen this one. This one hangs around all year round and they often come to bird feeders. I see them in my backyard, up in trees and shrubs, hanging around together in a little flock. They are also a songbird shape, but these guys are little. They're smaller than a sparrow. If I look at their colors and patterns, I notice that they've got a tiny black beak and a black cap and a black chin. And if I look at their wings, I see there's some lighter gray bars among the darker gray feathers. And the behavior that I notice with these birds is that they're always moving around. They're super active. And I notice one other thing. When they come to my bird feeder, they take a seed and they fly away with it instead of eating it on the spot. When I hear this bird calling, one of its calls sounds like chickadee dee dee. Let's listen. Maybe you've heard that call before too. We'll put all the clues together and this bird is called a black cat chickadee. It's named for the way it looks and the way it sounds. Chickadees have a lot of different calls to communicate with each other about predators and food and other birds. If there's danger nearby, they use that chickadee D call and they add a whole bunch of DDDs to the end. So everybody's warned about what's nearby. Some other birds understand chickadee language and they travel with them for safety and to help them find food too. One cool thing about chickadees is that when they take that seed from the feeder and they go someplace else, often they go and hide it or cache it for later. Chickadees have a really great memory. They can hide hundreds of seeds in a day and remember where they put all of them. All right, let's try one more bird. Maybe you've seen this one around your yard. I kind of think of this bird as the forest alarm. I see them in neighborhoods and parks and forests, and some of them are here all year round. They are also a songbird shape, but they're larger than a sparrow and smaller than a crow. If I look at the colors and patterns, the first thing I notice is the blue color is so pretty. And they've got blue on their back and their wings and tails, and their head has a crest or a pointed group of feathers that are also blue. Around their neck, they have a black collar or necklace, and their beaks are kind of large. When I see these guys, I notice how noisy they are. They're often calling from trees, and they're usually with other birds just like themselves. And I think their call sounds like, J, 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 let's listen. So putting all our clues together, we know this is a blue jay, another bird that's named for the way it looks and the way it sounds. Blue jays have a lot of different calls and they can even imitate the sound of a hawk. Sometimes they make that hawk call to warn all the other birds that there's a hawk nearby, but sometimes they use it to fool birds to scare them away from the feeder so they can come in and grab all the seeds themselves. Blue jays really like acorns and they will hide thousands of acorns in the forest every year. They don't always remember where the acorns are and some of them grow into new oak trees. You might think that a blue jay is really blue and I do have a blue jay feather right here that I found, but their feathers are really not blue. The color is made when light reflects off special cells on the feather and we see it as blue. But if you ever find a blue jay feather, hold it up to a bright light and you'll see that it's really brown. All right, so we're back to our picture of a whole bunch of common birds in Michigan. And we identified the American robin and the black-capped chick chickadee 
and the blue jay, but maybe next time you see some of these birds when you're out for a walk, you can use the clues that we covered to try and identify what these other birds might be. Remember to look at the habitat, the size and shape, the colors and patterns, listen for songs or calls, and watch their behavior. All right, let's finish up by talking about different ways that we can help birds. Sometimes things that affect birds also affect people and communities. Habitat loss is the number one threat to bird populations, but there are some easy things that we can do to help. You can provide water. Birds need water for drinking and bathing, and if you put a bird bath in your backyard, you might see more birds. You might also want to provide food by hanging feeders, especially in the wintertime. Different birds eat different kinds of seeds or foods and use different feeders to put them in. If you're thinking about growing any plants in your garden or around your yard, think about planting native plants. They provide the best food sources for birds. And even if your birds that visit your yard prefer nuts or seeds or berries or nectar, they almost all feed their babies, caterpillars and insects. And native plants support the widest variety of caterpillars and insects so that birds can find enough for their nestlings to eat. If you have room, you might want to provide some nesting sites. Some birds will use a nest box and you would want to be sure that you put them up before they come back to establish their breeding territories in the spring. Other birds might nest in a shrub or a tree in your yard and you can provide nesting materials for them to use. A really important thing to do is to keep your cat indoors. Thousands of birds fall victims to house cats every year, and the kitty is just using his instincts to hunt, but it's much safer to let your kitty do bird watching from inside the house. Migration is also a really perilous time for birds. Birds, most of them migrate at night, and so many migrate at the same time during ideal weather conditions that you can pick them up on weather radar and know when important migration days are coming in the spring and in the fall. Sometimes birds get confused by artificial lights, especially near cities. And so if you can see when birds might be migrating, it's important to shut off your lights or draw your drapes between 11 p.m. and 6 a.m. when the birds are most actively migrating. Another great thing you can do is participate in citizen science. There are a number of different projects that help contribute data that scientists and conservationists can use, or you might provide help by uh, participating in a stewardship project in your local park or community. I will say that birds are one of my favorite animals and they're fun to watch. They're always doing something different and they, their populations change depending on the time of year. So there's always something new to look at. Here's my contact information if you have more questions about birds and also links to the websites and a list of the apps that I talked about. So if you would like to screenshot this, slide, feel free to do so and contact me if you have further questions. And with that, I will let Natalie look at the Q&A and ask the questions that people might have. Well, hi everybody. Natalie Elkins returning here. We'd love to thank Karen for all that awesome bird information. And there were a couple of questions that came in to our question and answer today. So I'll read those out loud and Karen can give us her expertise about them. First of all, Kevin from Lansing asks, this is excellent, but I'll forget half of it. Is there a way we can get a copy of this presentation or watch it again so I can take notes? Yes, we are going to post all of our webinars on our Nature at School website, so you can watch them in the future. And we have several more coming up that you can participate in. And then secondly, if I wanted to put up a birdhouse, this is from Jagger and Holt. If I wanted to put up a birdhouse, is there one that several species will use or do I have to buy one house for each bird species? 
So different birds prefer different styles of houses. I think that a bluebird house attracts a lot of different kinds of species because the hole is big enough for smaller birds to get into. Something smaller like a wren house, you might only get wrens and chickadees to live in there. But there are other larger birds like wood ducks that will use a, a box high up in a tree that has a much larger hole. And little screech owls will also use that type of box. If you go to Project Feeder Watch or to that Cornell site all about birds, you can find a ton of information about different kinds of birdhouses as well as plans for building them if you want to try making your own. Oh, that's a great answer. Now I want to go try. So that's all the questions we have, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. We hope to see you again at one of the other 10 Nature at School webinar series programs, which you can find at michigan.gov slash nature at school. Until next time. Thank Bye, you. everyone. Bye.